Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you today, but through the magic of technology, it looks like I am. I understand Florida, where you are right now, is actually a pretty good spot for golf. And I was talking to John Bryden recently, and I just happened to ask him, well, John, what is your handicap? And without a pause, he literally said to me, well, I'd have to say my woods, my irons, and my putter. Now, I'm not a golfer, but I understand that Joe and John Bryden makes an understatement. It's just something that you got to take for granted, so watch out for him on the course. We're here today to talk about the reptile theory, which has been sort of the latest rage in the plaintiff's bar and even in the defense bar in recent years. And I want to cover a number of issues that the reptile theory goes over and perhaps some strategies that how you on the defense side can counter those strategy. So the plaintiff's reptile theory, in essence, is what they call the triune brain theory, which talks a little bit about the limbic system and the difference between the hypothalamus or the reptilian cortex um, and how that gets activated by some of the plaintiff's themes, mostly fear-based, that sort of activates it and gets jurors to act out of self-interest as opposed to judging the facts in the plaintiff's case. Now, the truth is that the reptilian brain or the hypothalamus or those, that, those core brain activities are really sort of what we call fight or flight. It's the autonomic nervous system, it's involuntary responses, and it's usually where we as, uh, as somebody feel our own personal fear. To be true, the anatomy actually doesn't make that much of a real difference here uh, because jurors sitting in the box actually aren't actually being activated by a fear, in other words, a fight or flight uh, syndrome, because they're not actually threatened. Now, they may feel empathy for the plaintiff, they may feel sympathy, they may want to act out of community good, but that's really an emotional response to the plaintiff's case. However, as I think a lot of the articles recognize, there's some, the, the anatomical or physical aspects of the reptilian theory is actually not as important as it is a metaphor. And to tell you the truth, the reptile has become more of a sort of umbrella term for a number of strategies that plaintiffs employ in their cases. I posted for you and you can see there's four main books in the plaintiff's canon that they usually refer to to do this. The main books are The Reptile Theory by uh, David Ball and Don Keenan. There's also a a book, a very good book, that I've recommended to most of you read also, called Rules of the Road by Rick Friedman. And uh, that obviously talks about how you can establish as a plaintiff rules that the defendant must stand by. Those two books by themselves really make up, I think, the backbone of the reptile theory. There's also a book called Trial by Human by a plaintiff attorney, a very successful plaintiff attorney here in California called Nick Rowley. And of course, David Ball's book on damages is another book that I've referred to in the past and that plaintiffs commonly use to to use in their cases. So these are the four main texts. I want to cover a few basic principles on these and that way we can really focus in on what they are doing and how we can counter some of these strategies. So, the main strategies that the plaintiff's bar has used, in essence, are one. There are seven main ones. One, that they want to control the primary focus of the case. In other words, under the reptile theory, safety becomes the primary focus or frame of the case. And therefore, all the debate, all the A lot of discovery, a lot of time in trial gets spent on this whole concept of safety. The second has to do with what uh, kind of obviously a very strong case narrative, constructing for them a a case story which is both compelling and uh, evokes the kinds of emotions that they hope to get in the jurors as they are listening to the case. The third element is to plant a series of hidden assumptions as to what the conduct of the of the defendant should have been and the rules that they should have followed. The also is what the plaintiffs want to do uh, both through the attorney presentations as well as through their witnesses is to establish a strong emotional connection between themselves and the jurors in the case. The fifth are setting us and establishing a series of rules and standards sometimes 
uh, unreasonably high rules and standards for the defendant to have met that obviously they contend the defendant did not meet in the case. And six is to anchor high dollar figures uh, as early as in voir dire and in opening statements so that the jury gets used to high damages in the case so that when it does come time to argue damages, they're used to the high dollar figures. And last is to exploit juror biases. We call these heuristics. I've gone over them before, but I'd like to cover them very briefly one more time just to give us a refresher. The main uh, juror biases that plaintiffs seek to use are one, um, hindsight bias, which is essentially we are using the information we have today to judge yesterday's actions and conduct. So that's a main bias that plaintiffs hope to exploit in jurors, that tendency to look backwards and think, you should have, you could have, and you would have known about these risks and dangers if you'd only done more. The second has to do with norm theory, which is they seek to establish by establishing a series of rules and standards for the defendant that here's the norm in the industry and therefore the defendant in their conduct fell outside that norm. Uh, availability bias, which is that the more time you spend in trial on a particular issue, i.e. safety, the more time the jury will spend on it and think that it is important. Um, fundamental attribution error is one where we say, we take a look at an action that a defendant has and then attribute uh, a character to it, such as uh, carelessness or disregard or that they somehow don't have a, a favorable opinion of their consumer. So that's a fundamental attribution error. Confirmation bias says that pretty much what we believe in our lives, what we already believe, we gather facts around and want to confirm what we already believe as opposed to listening and judging fresh evidence. And lastly, belief perseverance, which means that if we believe it strongly enough, we really don't care what contrary evidence has to say about it. We're still gonna wanna believe what we already believe. Those are the main biases that plaintiffs hope to exploit uh, in these cases, and I wanted to just touch on those briefly. Now, in turning to the issue of safety, again, the main tenet of the reptile theory, uh, what they typically hope to do is to establish for the defendant that safety is the top, if not the only priority for the defendant in looking out for the consumer, an employee, a worker of any type, that's, it's the top, if not the only concern. That's protection against that risk or against that harm is again a top, if not the only priority for the defendant in looking after consumer or the public's general safety. That any danger or any risk is not appropriate and that somehow we have to guard against all risks and all dangers as defendants. And lastly, that somehow the defendants should have done more, could have done more, and if they had done more, this never would have happened to the plaintiff. These are a ser series of, again, safety standards that they hope to establish in both deposition and obviously in trial. Um, on this whole issue of known and knowable, which has to do with key issues in the plaintiff's case, foreseeability and preventability, um, and a series of issues that they hope to establish with this are one, how likely was it that the defendant's act or omission would hurt somebody? They're trying to establish that the defendant had knowledge in their own pockets at the time that they knew that the harm probably would have befallen the plaintiff in the case. The second question has to do with how much harm could it have caused in general? Again, seeking to establish that they knew not only that a harm would be caused, but that the significance of that harm would have been foreseen and would have been widespread. And lastly, how much harm could have caused in other situations? And this is where they start to creep outside uh, the plaintiff's case and trying to reach into the juror's consciousness and say, as a public member, as a member of your community, you should have seen this because this is a danger to you. And therefore, when you're acting as a juror, you're not only acting on behalf of this plaintiff, you're acting on your own community's behalf. Now, 
What are the hidden assumptions in this reptile theory and in this primary focus on safety? There's four main assumptions that I think are contained in this theory. First, that the defendant essentially has all of the knowledge, the expertise, and the power in the situation. They control everything. Number two, that the defendant can foresee with this great knowledge and this great foreseeability, they can foresee all risks and all harms, no matter how remote. Three, that the defendant's main responsibility is to protect the public from all of these foreseeable risks that they themselves have ample knowledge of. And four, that the defendant is responsible for the actions of the individual who uses their products and services. Again, this is a key hidden assumption that essentially takes all responsibility away from the plaintiff or away from their families or employers or other perhaps um, parties in the case and says that we as the one who contain most of the knowledge and the power essentially absolve and take responsibility for all actions in the case. It's a very dangerous assumption that we absolutely have to address in trial. Now, the question becomes, how do plaintiffs actually employ these strategies? Well, the first, obviously, that you need to uh, uh, address has to do with depositions, and witness preparation is key in addressing these. Um, one of the issues has to do with, that you'll definitely deal with, are deposition questions about safety standards and their importance. So you'll get uh, your witnesses, whether they're your person's most knowledgeable, whether they're your company witnesses, or, and even your experts, about what are the safety standards and how important are those standards. Uh, deposition questions about industry standards and norms and practices. Those, again, seek to establish that the industry standard, that there is no sort of individual circumstance, that everything is well established about how foreseeable these risks are, and everybody else takes great caution with these things except for you, the defendant. Three, that deposition questions about awareness or risk of the danger. In other words, how aware of you, what studies have you seen, what are the things that you've done in your own research and development that prompts you to know exactly what the risk or the harm or the danger that befell the plaintiff actually is. And deposition questions about cost. Those are the main uh, questions there. Now, how would I uh, deal with this? Because deposition preparation is actually quite key in this, in helping a witness to really understand the questions that they're being asked and how to respond so that you actually put into context the responsibilities of this and to address some of these hidden assumptions. So you want to, number one, have your witnesses give full responses to your, the questions. And this is sometimes a little contrary to some of the deposition preparation techniques that are out there, which is having the witness limit their answers to very short yes, no answers, or I don't remember answers. We want them to address some of these hidden assumptions to give full context, full sentences, so that they can actually control the frame of this and not make it seem like the plaintiff is planting all of these hidden assumptions. So a few examples. One is a question example that you might get or one of your witnesses might get in deposition is, uh, isn't consumer or user safety the most important issue for you when you research, develop, and design a product for the public's use? Now, a problem answer to that would be either yes or, obviously, no, which you don't want to do. The problem with the yes answer is, although it sounds seemingly reasonable, is that, again, it becomes the top priority and it establishes a standard or a norm by then which everybody else in the company is then going to be judged by and which your actions will be judged by. A better example is to actually provide a context. So when you get that, even though it's a yes, no question, I would have the witness give a fuller response, a, a much uh, more explanatory response to which they would say something like, well, along with consumer utility or usefulness, the availability of the product and the affordability of the product, um, 
Consumer or user safety is certainly an important issue when we design and market our products or our services. Again, it puts it into context. It doesn't dismiss it, it doesn't say no. It also doesn't say it is the most important, but in the configuration of all the concerns, it puts it into context. And that way, again, the witness is answering and truthfully, and again, this doesn't have to be their exact response, but it is allowing them to explain what it is. Now, undoubtedly, the plaintiffs will try to make, push them to make it seem as if it's the most important, but the truth is, as we all well know, it's a very complicated answer, and it's not a simple yes or no as the most important. The most important when, the most important uh, compared to what. So I think the context answer is appropriate, and the witness should not be limited to just a yes, no on this, and should fully explain that. Again, it allows them to put it into context. One other thing to keep in mind, though, is that these safety standards, although traditionally we think of them as only applying to the defendant in the case, well, of course, they apply to the plaintiff as well. They, in, in our depositions, we can also anchor in these safety concerns as well by asking the plaintiffs and their family members and other parties that may have responsibility in this that they also have to be aware of user safety, user precautions. And again, it establishes that Everybody has responsibility here, and the defendant is not the sole person with the only responsibility. Now, let's turn to voir dire a little bit. This is moving a little bit away from classic reptile theory, but I still think it is a plaintiff strategy that we need to pay attention to. And it has to do with how um, the attorneys in, the plaintiff attorneys in voir dire seek to establish uh, a certain rapport with the jurors, and uh, communication and emotional empathy with the jurors, with their plaintiffs, as well as anchor high dollar figures. Um, and plaintiff attorneys are starting to learn their, on their colleges, they're really learning um, sometimes their acting skills, but sometimes they are actually working to make a deep emotional connection themselves with the jurors, so that they're really in voir dire, building a natural rapport, having a conversation, really doing their best to try and enhance their credibility with the jurors in the case to establish that emotional connection not only with them as the vehicles for their plaintiffs but also with the plaintiffs themselves. The second thing they do is they want to establish that the jurors are acting as the conscience of the community and in public safety. Obviously this is not the law and something that you should be aware of as you are listening to voir dire and even make motions to the judge to prevent attorneys from making that plea uh, in voir dire as jurors as conscience of the community. Uh, obviously, they are impaneled. They're a representative cross-section of the community, so plaintiffs may be able to argue we're entitled to ask these questions because that's a part of jury service, but it's something to be aware of because, uh, and then we may have to do some counter questions on this in voir dire to ask jurors essentially are you also willing to listen to the individual facts of this case and not consider yourselves as acting as the community as a whole. The other thing that we've sometimes started seeing, especially uh, here in California, is that uh, getting, giving specific high dollar figures in voir dire, specifically how plaintiffs will sometimes get up and ask jurors whether they uh, would be unwilling to award a significant damage figure such as $20 million in a severe injury case. Now, the truth is that the plaintiffs may have no intention of ever asking for $20 million, but the $20 million anchor allows them to do a couple things. The first is it allows them to identify jurors who absolutely no way, shape, or form would ever uh, award that kind of money, and then to, for them to make an appropriate cause challenge or peremptory challenge on that particular juror. But however, if that figure, $20 million, gets mentioned enough in voir dire, it becomes an anchor. And an anchor, as I, as I can remind you of, is essentially when jurors don't have enough facts to actually appropriately sit down and say, here's what the dollar figure is, they tend to gravitate toward any number that's thrown out. So if they hear $20 million a number of times in voir dire, 
they may actually think they're doing the defendant a favor by coming back with an $8 million verdict or a $12 million verdict. They think they're saving money for them and they think that's what becomes reasonable. The way that we need to counter some of these strategies are one, we ourselves need to build a rapport in voir dire. And sometimes on the defense side, I think we spend a lot of time sort of instructing jurors, getting commitments on them to listen to all the evidence, to be patient, to follow the law, to not be emotional, as opposed to actually having a genuine conversation with them and really building rapport with them so that they actually like us, like our case, like our, our defendants and our clients. And so we should be conscious of trying to build rapport with those jurors as well so that we can create that kind of emotional connection to our case. The second thing is to uh, actually try and talk to the judge about not having the plaintiffs anchoring these high, high dollar figures. I, I actually think it's inappropriate for plaintiffs to say a $20 million figure in a case because that is asking them to prejudge the evidence. It's not inappropriate for them to see whether a juror would be unable to essentially award a high dollar figure or a significant sum, even in the millions of dollars, but to actually put an actual number on it, I think is inappropriate. So I think motions should be made on that. Um, if for some reason the judge says no and you get a lot of high dollar figures, for instance, in some case, a juror themselves might say, well, I think $20 million is way too high, I wouldn't do that. And you have jurors talking a lot about that $20 million figure in the case we then need to come back and actually what I call scramble that anchor. In other words, play, place a counter anchor and ask jurors if the evidence permitted, even with a significant, seemingly significant injury, whether they'd be willing to award just a couple hundred thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars or one point two million dollars or you know, and just throw out a number of numbers so that the jurors just don't have that single high dollar figure planted in their head at the beginning. One thing that we've actually done recently, I did it recently in a case uh, in Orange County, which is we actually asked some questions about anchors, which asked jurors whether they themselves were aware of the concept of anchors and whether they knew that sometimes without enough information we would tend to gravitate toward whatever number is thrown out and whether they would just tend to gravitate toward that $20 million figure just because the plaintiff said it. Again, the most dangerous bias is a hidden bias. If you can tell jurors that you are, to a certain extent, being manipulated and that you are, uh, there's some psychological ploys at place, they will fight against those ploys. Finally, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about non-economic damages because it's something we started seeing in a lot of the cases that we've been dealing with here. Um, high dollar figures, our research recently on uh, both damages cases significantly shows that as opposed to them being jurors awarding money in high dollar figures for what they thought are reasonable compensation or uh, for it, they usually carry a punitive component and an anger component. In other words, all of the strategies that we have talked about so far, violation of safety standards, knowledge of the defendant, and preventability of the harms that are being caused, if plaintiff can establish those three elements, it tends to make jurors angry. They know this formula. They play with this formula. So they know that if they can get the jurors angry, they're going to want to award more money, even, as a, even though punitive damages may not be a part of the case. As a result, what we start seeing, especially in California, is plaintiffs who have relatively low economic damages, sometimes even dismissing those economic damages as the case, and only trying a non-economic damage case. Again, and then what you tend to hear with that is that the plaintiffs will then make arguments. They obviously bring in emotional testimony from the plaintiffs themselves. And then they talk about um, the loss that either the plaintiff suffered or the family of the plaintiff uh, has suffered as that this person, every person is a masterpiece and masterpieces in art shows uh, command millions and millions and millions of dollars. Why not a person? They sometimes will do a strategy which I call job application, which is 
How much money would you take if you were to take the job of, of enduring the pain and discomfort and humiliation that this plaintiff has lived with and will live with for the rest of their lives? How much money would you accept for that? Would it be just a mere few hundred thousand dollars or would you expect that to be millions of dollars over the course of a lifetime? Or they sometimes do what I call component damages, which is taking every aspect of every non-economic damage and attaching a dollar figure so that pain gets something, suffering gets something, emotional distress gets something, a dollar figure for loss of consortium in terms of compassion, uh, comfort. Each of those gets a dollar figure, and as a result, obviously, it adds up to a very, very significant figure. And overall, overriding all of this, is that the portrait of the plaintiff's future is bleak. In non-economic damages, they will never get over this grief, they will never get over this tragedy, and they will suffer with this for the rest of their lives. One of the things we've ha started having some pretty good success with right now, although we are contending liability, is when we get to uh, non-economic damages and talking about it ourselves, the difficulty with jurors is that if they don't know what to award, they sometimes will want to, especially if it's been an egregious injury, they will want to award a lot just to make sure the plaintiffs have, have, have enough in the future. But it's a, usually a bleak portrait. And one of the things that we found success in is actually portraying a more optimistic outcome in the plaintiffs' lives. In other words, we then actually become somewhat advocates for the plaintiffs themselves and a positive outcome in their life. In other words, instead of sort of saying, well, that just seems really too high and that doesn't seem reasonable and our figures are, you know, X few thousands of dollars and therefore the jurors are left with this very high dollar figure versus a very low dollar figure, which obviously sometimes they compromise in the middle. What we end up doing is putting a component there and taking economic, non-economic damages and saying, let's see what it will take to emotionally put this plaintiff and their family back on track. Get them back to where they were, not where they were because obviously you can't obviously compensate for the loss of a person, but help them move on with their lives. And this allows us to take an optimistic view of their future and to say to the jurors, give them counseling. Give them enough money for counseling once, twice, three times a week, for a period, two years, three years, five years, then if it's a real significant injury, it looks like it's going to be difficult, give them an extra couple of years, give them a checkup, give them, um, give them some additional damages, give them uh, an education, give them skills, give them a vacation, give them a honeymoon, give them different things that will help um, establish for them a positive outlook and a positive view and skills and tools where they themselves can take control of their lives back and move on with their lives. It has an end point. It, it doesn't mean long-term suffering till the end of time for these plaintiffs. And to a certain extent, I think from a defense perspective, it's actually a compassionate way that we can look at the, to the jurors and say, we're not cold, we understand the loss. And even though we're disputing liability, if for some reason you are going to award damages, um, then we believe that these would be appropriate in terms of compensating them really for that non-economic damages, that emotional uh, distress, that pain and suffering. Let's help them get on with their lives and make a better future. With that, again, I'm sorry, everybody. I couldn't be with you here today. But again, I thank John for helping me with the wonder of technology here, and I do hope to join you soon. Thanks very much.